<clears throat> All right, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to be with you today and uh, we at least uh, here have a lovely sunny sunny day in Ann Arbor. I hope you're having a good day wherever you are. Um, this is the November meeting of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. I'm Glenda Bullock. I'm the program chair of the Culinary Historians uh, and uh, we're very happy to have with us today our speaker, Dr. Cindy Ott. She is going to be sharing the curious history of the pumpkin in American culture. And our partner uh, today, as always, is the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, they provide promotional and technical support for us, and they make it possible for our programs to be shared beyond the walls of the library and beyond the, uh, uh, the borders of Ann Arbor because they record and post videos uh, of many of our culinary historians programs on the library's YouTube channel, AADL-TV. Uh, I know it's been a while since we've done a, a Zoom uh, culinary historians meeting. Um, I had the uh, uh, the feeling it might not be such a nice day in November, uh, and it would be good to do the meeting online, and uh, it is a nice day, but uh, as a result of doing it on entirely on Zoom, we are uh, privileged to be able to reach out to uh, speakers in other parts of the country, and our speaker today is actually joining us from Montana. Um, so for any new viewers today, uh, we wanted to give you a little information about the culinary historians of Ann Arbor. We're an informal group of people who are interested in the history and culture of food and cooking. The group was founded in 1983 and new members are always welcome. We have uh, monthly talks between September and May, uh, some are in person at the library, some are online, depending on uh, the speaker's proximity to Ann Arbor. We have twice yearly potluck themed meals, normally in July and December, and our winter meal is coming up on December 10th. The theme is going to be following in the footsteps of Nellie Bly, the intrepid 19th century journalist who set out to travel around the world in less than 80 days. So if you're a member, you have already received information about the meal, and I want to let you know I will be sending out a final reminder late next week. In the meantime, there is a link to the event on our website on the program schedule page, uh, so you can get more information there. If you're not a member of the Culinary Historians, we would love to have you join. Our membership is $25 a year for an individual or a family, and it includes a subscription to our quarterly magazine, Repast, edited by Randy Schwartz. If you'd like to join our group, there is membership available on our website, culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org. <clears throat> All you have to do is click on membership. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, just search for Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor and like our page and you will get our news on your timeline. Uh, and now I am very happy to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Cindy Ott is an Associate Professor of History and Museum Studies at the University of Delaware. She's also an active museum curator and public historian. She has organized cultural history projects and art exhibitions at the Smithsonian Institution, among many other uh, organizations, including serving on the team that organized the exhibition Julia Child's Kitchen at the Museum of American History. For the past decade, she has spent most summers living and working on a cattle ranch on the Crow Reservation in Montana and has produced an exhibition about Crow Indian gardeners there. These experiences led to her current book project, Biscuits and Buffalo, the reinvention of American Indian culture in the 20th and 21st centuries and the public humanities project, the Crow Indian Virtual Archive and Museum. Work at a Maryland farm stand and studies for her master's degree at Yale led to her first book, Pumpkin, The Curious History of an American Icon, published by the University of Washington Press in 2012. And she is joining us here today to share some of the lore from that book and perhaps some of her current research. Welcome, Cindy Ott. No, thank you so much for having me. And thanks so many of you for, for coming out today on a, a Sunday afternoon. I know there's a lot of things you could be uh, doing. So I appreciate you being here to learn about the pumpkin. And, and I guess if you went out at any time this weekend, you uh, probably uh, passed many pumpkins on your way. And this time of year, it's a big question for many anybody about, you know, why the pumpkin or they see it and you think, well, what what's going on here? So that was kind of the point of my book. I started with that question too. It's being surrounded by pumpkins this time of year. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Glendon for all of those at the um, Ann Arbor Culinary, uh, 
society there um, for inviting me to be a part of this program. So thank you so much to all of you. So um, I'm going to walk you through some of the images. I talk about this project, how I came about the project, the kind of the findings that I have, why uh, you need to care about the pumpkin or the reasons that Americans in particular love the pumpkin so much and the impacts that kind of uh, and fascination with the pumpkins American have has had actually on uh, rural communities. So I'll just uh, get started. And then we'll have, you can save, you could, there's a place, you know, in chat, you can um, put some questions if you have it, but I'll probably wait to the end to answer any of your questions. So let me just share screen here. So this is a picture of my friend's pumpkin stand that uh, I was helping him work at, I mean, years ago now. This is 2012, but it was probably in the mid 90s or so. He's just, I grew up in the DC suburbs. And so I would help him in the fall work his fall pumpkin stand. But I had started graduate studies and studying environmental history. And, and I then after being out there several weekends in a row, I started thinking to myself, like, what is going on here? Like, why are literally thousands of families piling into their car, driving 30 miles from their homes out into the country to buy this vegetable that they're not even gonna eat. And then of course, that question leads to the question, like why are they putting vegetables on their front stoop? You know, why have Americans turned this very plain tasting vegetable really into a very celebratory part of a national holiday when most people around the world eat pumpkin without any pomp and circumstance at all throughout the rest of the year? And also like why have small towns started putting on pumpkin festivals across the country when many of them have no actual economic history or historic ties to the crop at all. So those basic questions led to the bigger questions about how Americans have used nature and history and food to think about themselves, how they've used them to create national and personal traditions. And then really important for me too, what are the impacts of these ideas and these traditions with the pumpkin. Um, so those are the basic questions that got me started on this project. And so uh, Glenda mentioned a little bit, but just in terms of my own background, so you know where I'm coming from, um, I studied American studies, a very interdisciplinary way of studying history and cultures. I came out of the museum field before working on my graduate program. So um, I was interested when I started um, as a graduate student and then as an academic, I've always been interested in how you can understand American history and culture through common everyday things. And then food is such a great one to study these that topic because you can't, you know, understand anyone's appetite for food from any one perch alone. You know, it doesn't make sense if like, oh, it's because of they're male or they're female or because they live in the Midwest or because they were born at a certain time or because of the financial aspects. You know, it really people's appetites only make sense from these multiple, how all these different things can influence each other. So it's a really great kind of interdisciplinary way to study history and cultures, food is in particular. So why the pumpkin? Why did I start with the pumpkin? Of course, there's many fruits and vegetables, which many of you could name, corn, cherries, you know, apple, particularly in American culture, but all around the world, the storybooks of lore about these things. Um, but what's special then I think about the pumpkin to study uh, American society's cultures, one is its huge size, so and which then has inspired many meanings. So of course, you know, a big apple could be impressive, a big tomato, but you know, it's hard to compare, which we'll talk about the, you know, a grand size of a, a pumpkin, but even in, you know, a kind of an ordinary average size one like this. So it's, you know, it's huge. Um, and also unlike these other things, like even with these pick your own farms or strawberries and apples, there's almost no utilitarian function for uh, pumpkins in American culture. I mean, we all know we could eat pumpkin throughout the year, it, you know, canned, it survives a long time, but really 90% is in the fall when it doesn't have to be. So it's a great way to study pe how people invest meanings in, with food and ideas in food, because there's almost no practical function for it in American society. So it's a good way to study the values about nature and food for its meanings, not just its practical purpose. So the basic point, which I'll, I'll lie out, and then I'm going to kind of go back and explain how we got here, is there's no practical reason to put, you know, pumpkin in your cup of coffee, to put a pumpkin on your front stoop or turn it into a dessert. But these traditions date back to much older traditions of associating the pumpkin with the small family farm and associating the pumpkin as a symbol of natural abundance in the simple farm life. And then the kind of hook about why we need to care, which again, I'll walk through a little slower, is that the popularity of pumpkin pie and the jack-o'-lantern has actually helped to rejuvenate the very thing it represents a small scale farmer. 
So because of the peculiarities of the crop, you can plant a few seeds, get a pretty good yield on pretty small acreage. So something about the natural history and then something about the economy too. It's a lim it's a limited market. It's a niche market for small scale family farmers. They call it lucrative, but limited. Um, so uh, it's a niche market for them. There's only about eight weeks. So like big corporate uh, companies have tried to take over pumpkin production for various reasons. It hasn't worked. And then because of these meanings associated with it, it has actually become a really important market economy for small scale farmers where they've, they can stay farming small scale, like, you know, 300 acres or more, instead of having to do something else because of the, the, the uh, pumpkin. So Libby's, for example, it probably, they again have like 85, 90% of canned pumpkin. Any of you make pumpkin pie, if not using fresh pumpkin, you're likely using Libby's. Most people do. So in the 1970s, they had, they tried to have a, like uh, import pumpkins from a big corporate farm in California, and it just didn't pay off. So now they distribute the seeds about 70 or so small scale, again, 300, 600 acres farmers, and they pay those farmers the same that those farmers would get for the commodity crops of corn or soybeans to grow pumpkins. So even the most sort of industrial scale of pumpkin production is, is sustaining the small scale farmer. Stories about that I interviewed farmers about pulling up a pig spot a pig's died um, to put up pumpkin patch because they made more money selling pumpkins those few weeks of the year than than selling uh, hogs. So then again, so just to you know reiterate these big ideas for you to think about when we when we reel back and understand where we got to this place. So that why we need to care is these very romantic ideas, these romantic myths about the and these holiday traditions that that Americans have created to use this you know forge a sense of national identity associated with Thanksgiving and also these family traditions. They're very nostalgic responses to maybe changing relationships with nature and industrialization, but they're not peripheral to, you know, the, the hard world of economics and 21st century agriculture. In fact, these myths, these food traditions um, are actually changing how markets operate. Um, so these things are interconnected. So we, it's, it's, you know, it's not just studying the ideas and that's interesting enough to explain these things, but also to understand the real powerful impact and how our Americans love affair with the pumpkin is actually helping to keep the very thing it represents alive, these small scale um, farmers and keeping them doing that instead of doing something else. So those are the big picture. Now I want to go back a little bit. Oh, here's some examples of these very, um, you know, in, in, impractical, but very uh, beloved um, traditions of the pumpkin in 21st century that is actually helping keeping these farms going. So how do we get here? So the pumpkin is actually the oldest domesticated plant in the New World, um, older than corn and beans, 10,000 BC, the Oaxaca Highlands. By the time the Europeans arrived, it, with, it spread all across the Americas. Um, and it was a celebratory, very celebratory part of traditions. You can see here this round, you know, on the image on the left, that, that there's it, it exudes status into the leader, this pumpkin and, you know, pumpkin and squash here, as well as the other way around, you know, having this royalty on these things. So this was, you could tell by images like this, that this was something that's really valuable. And, you know, you can probably guess it's, you know, it's a crop that's prolific grows like a weed, it can sustain it. So there was a lot of reasons to celebrate the harvest of the pumpkin and in terms of, you know, making food available in times what was not available, you know, in the in the winter time, and maybe even on low on meat. So they continue many different native communities continue to have their different traditions with pumpkin. But today, I'm going to talk about explaining the kind of, you know, the the suburban neighborhood, um, the common everyday way that we, you know, we associate and think about pumpkins today in terms of Thanksgiving, Halloween, and these uh, traditions of going out to the pumpkin patch, knowing that there's different ways that people have thought about pumpkins as well, different traditions. So back then, um, at the time of the colonial era, so the pumpkin was a food that colonists relied on because they tried to grow other things when they got there. They wanted their cabbages. They wanted familiar foods. You know, people like their familiar foods but they couldn't grow them right away. And so they had to rely on the pumpkin. Um, and so were they very happy to have the pumpkin, but it was, for them, it was like a food of last resort. Um, and it was a food that 
also impressed Europeans that were coming over because of its great size and the prolific nature of it. So you can see an image here, here it's just kind of like a schematic view of the um, Americas. And then you see like the native turkeys to America. That's something that impressed the person that created this to write these documentation back to Europe of what the, the Americas are like. And then you see here these, uh, the pumpkins, you have grapevines, you have, you know, you could hunt. And so they have images of that too. So the pumpkin is one of the things that impressed them the most. Um, but it was a scene as a food that was like a food that you didn't really want to have, like a food of like that was seen as like an under primitive wild conditions. And that's because of the nature of the crop, but also because it came from the Americas. And, you know, in a very derogatory way, this is how they thought of native peoples and this is how they thought of the place. It was kind of uncivilized compared to Europeans. So way before anybody wanted to eat it in Europe, they used the pumpkin to depict an idea that they had about, especially about wild nature. So in images like this, where you can see like the centaur has a foot on the pumpkin. Um, it was, so, if it's associated with the human, it's like, it's empty headed, you know, he's empty headed kind of pompous. This is a, a amalgam kind of portrait of a, a politician, a prince. And so he's kind of empty headed and pompous. So it was always associated then, not just because of the, the conditions of the colonists there, but because of these associations with the place. Um, not even because, well, they didn't like it. You know, it's the kind of thing they didn't eat it. So they didn't like it and they didn't like it. So they didn't eat it. You know, these things kind of influence each other. And that was these people's feelings about the pumpkin, the huge size, it could represent wild nature, the nature of the crop, but also the cultural associations with the, with the Americas. Um, and, and so then they're recording it in the, in, uh, in the botanical dictionaries as well. And in this case, the botanical dictionaries, they get confused about, well, what's a pumpkin, what's a squash? So they start because a pumpkin and squash are actually interchangeable. It's the same banana botanical plant. So, you know, you know, you can take like the orange field pumpkin and it's a cucubita pepo and it can cross with a zucchini because it's the same. That's also a cucubita pepo. We, of course, think about those things in very different ways. But that's because they have different stories that Americans have told about them, not because there's anything in, intrinsic, intrinsically different. You saw that image with the Indians, all these pumpkin and squash, like some things we might say a pumpkin, some were squash. They thought about them in this era through the 17th century very interchangeably because they, they used them the same way. They thought about them the same way. It, so it's another story then. It's a cultural story, not a botanical story to explain why the pumpkin became the pumpkin the orange round one. So the one of the first um, times that you see us kind of start to have the separation between a pumpkin and a squash is and actually many of you might be familiar with this Amelia Simmons American Cookery. It's the first American cookbook that was actually published in the US. So you could have cookbooks that came from France or from England or from other places, but this is the first one that was published. And this is the first time then where you have a pumpkin in the dessert section and you have squash as we imagine like winter squash now and kind of the everyday um, vegetable section. So they start to, it starts to mean something uh, different to them. Um, and uh, so what starts to happen then is uh, in this, in this time period is people are, you know, Americans have often liked to think of themselves as farmers at heart, but almost as soon as most people live a farming way of life, as soon as they can, they'll move into the city because it's, you know, it's unrelenting work. It's hard to make enough money at it. And so what starts to happen then around this time period is that um, people are moving into cities, they're moving into office jobs, they're moving into factories, you know, life is easier, but they start getting a little stressed about losing connection to nature and a kind of authentic way of life. Um, and, so then at the time period, so squash, like little winter squash and zucchini, they're still showing up in the marketplace. They're easy to get into town. The big old round orange pumpkin, it kind of stays behind on the farm. Like it's, it, they, people keep producing it on these small scale farms because it's a cheap substitute for livestock fodder. They don't really even eat it. People aren't even eating it anymore, but they they keep it in production, but it doesn't like fit into the, like the big new, you know, starting to rise of big industrial agricultural in America. Um, the, the wandering vines, the pumpkin don't fit into that. So for all kinds of reasons, it's worth nothing almost on the, you know, in an agricultural economy at the time. But right at that time, there's no use for it. People aren't really eating it anymore. You start to see it in these like beautiful paintings about rural life, this rustic image 
of rural life. And, you know, dating back to then these ideas about connecting with nature, it's this beautiful, wonderful symbol of natural abundance and having a sense of at this time period, wilderness isn't something scary you want to change, but you just want to like dip in, you know, 1870s, this is when you start to have national parks and people are worried about destroying wild nature because of industrialization. And, and then they're thinking about, it's not just preserving it because it's pretty, but you can go find yourself and there's stories that you tell of them. So you know, as many of you know, like Jeffersonian the agrarian ideals, this is the ideal that you're going to plot out the whole country on a grid of small family farmers, because farmers are seen as people with strong virtue and good morals because they take care of themselves. You know, they work hard in the land. So all these kinds of stories then get wrapped up in this orange round pumpkin. And that squash, meanwhile, you know, is still available in the marketplace. It still has a monetary value. You see it every day. But then the pumpkin starts taking on these connotations. It's because of its size, its shape, but also because of these deep meanings and association with the small scale uh, farm. So in the colonial period, too, we associate um, the pumpkin, of course, with with the pilgrims. Um, and that first, you know, famous 1621, of course, there's many Thanksgivings, but we associated with this one of lore. Um, but there's no the two documentations of that celebration. There's actually no mention of a pumpkin. The, one of the words they used to describe it could have been a squash, but it's it's uncertain. But certainly if they ate it for Thanksgiving, they probably ate it the day before and they did the day after too. And they didn't eat it as a pie. They ate it as a very savory kind of stew where they take like a, a big pot of water. They throw some meat in there. If they were lucky to have it, they throw pumpkins and they just keep throwing things on it and kind of eat this stew continually as long as they could. So if they ate it, no record of it, um, that's how they would have, have eaten it. So it wasn't, there was no pomp and circumstance around the pumpkin at this famous uh, first Thanksgiving. So Amelia Simmons is the first time that you start to see that. And the other thing I think to keep in mind too, about like it appearing in the cookbook and then starting to turn it into pie as it's something different. As soon as it starts to appear in these, um, these beautiful paintings of rural life, um, also in the 19th century, there's a lot of uh, poems and short stories written about the pumpkin. Whittier has a famous one here, Oh, Fruit, Love of Boyhood, you know, really calling back the images that are still familiar to us out now about rural nostalgia, going back to like the good life of our, our grandparents or great grandparents and this kind of nostalgia about that way of life, even though most of us, you know, most Americans don't want to be a farmer, but they like the idea of being a farmer at heart and what that what that means. Um, and then for women, of course, you know, being able to cook like Amelia Simmons, she's kind of a composite made up, probably not a real person, but still for women, it's invested in, and even in the revolution, the idea that you could produce a food that you could take care of your family and not have to depend on like imports from like England or something like that was a really strong symbol of independence too. So there were stories that people were telling about being, this is particularly American story as small families taking them step taking care of themselves. We don't need to depend on like, you know, mother England, we can do it on our own. And of course, women, you know, didn't have the right to vote. They didn't really have much of a public voice, but when they're cooking these foods that are deeply meaningful, they're turning the kitchen then into a really powerful political place because it becomes like a, a patriotic cause. And then this food and these, like the pie can mean American independence, agrarian ideals, and then they cook the pie and they're feeding it to others. And then they're spreading those, those ideals. So a time when you don't have a limited voice, it's a way to think about the women in the kitchen were actually trying to influence and having a fundamental part of understanding, creating ideas and perpetuating ideas about what it means to be American and this ideas of independence. Um, so then uh, around, you know, 1863, Thanksgiving becomes a national holiday, in part the huge influence of um, Sarah Jessica Hale, this woman here on the right, she uh, she wrote, she was editor of Ladies Goaties magazine, one of the most popular women's magazines. Um, you, you know, this is a still familiar song with Lydia Child, you might have heard her for that over the river and through the woods that we still sing. Um, so they were, and so she wrote this Northwood, which is a very nostalgic uh, book about New England and had a big section on going back to the family farm, just like Lydia's over the river, through the woods to, you know, grandparents' house to the, to the farm at Thanksgiving. So she was very influential for um, uh, Lincoln declaring it a national holiday. So first, you know, bigger, even then it became in, is, is now then 4th of July is a holiday representing the nation. And of course it's a holiday based on food and the harvest. 
Um, and at that time period too, 1863, obviously in the midst of the Civil War. So it was a very strong, the pumpkin too, and this is an interesting story about it, is that a lot of these folks that were promoting Thanksgiving and then promoting the pie and pr or promoting the pumpkin, um, writing these saccharine kind of sweet stories about them, were actually really strong abolitionists. So the pumpkin field, the pumpkin farmers, like that image I showed, for them represented the, like the uh, the yeoman farther of the north was these like moral virtue, these small scaly farms epitomized by the pumpkin because there's no economic value even, even in it. So it really represents these ideals more. And they very self-consciously contrasted that to the slaveholding South. So some of these most prolific pumpkin storytellers were actually really powerful um, abolitionists, Whittier included, um, Sarah Jessica Hale, the one, you know, over the, through the woods, um, we've kind of lost track of, um, uh, no, Hale, but child with over the river through the woods and Hale, all of these were very powerful, um, uh, um, abolitionists at the time. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very Northern story that they were used comparing to the South, but also then of course, during the midst of the civil war, when they were trying to say that, you know, the Northerners have the, the righteous cause um, and uh, at this time period. Um, and so there starts to develop these different traditions about the meaning of the pumpkin. You can grow the pumpkin in the South. There's a little town, Pumpkinville, South Carolina, but now, which many of you, if you have any Southern friends, African-American friends, family members from the South, that a lot of them will per prefer to eat um, sweet potato pie instead of pumpkin pie. And that's true to this day. And that's because of the different stories that were told about it. So the idea of the yeoman farmer in the North gets tied into this very quaint little New England farm uh, and ideas of virtue. The idea of the yeoman farmer in the South is not so nostalgic. It's often the tenant farmer, really struggling, really poor, doesn't even own the land. And so it doesn't really resonate quite the same way. And so the pumpkin can, it's always been this way too. Like it, it's a term of uh, nostalgia and, but also like a little, you can make fun of like a pumpkin farmer that they're just like, the, the term is like pumpkin roller that they're just kind of poor, like barely getting by. And it could be a term of derision for African-American farmers too. There's a very, you know, very problematic caricatures of African-Americans and pumpkins making fun of them as if they can't really succeed or something like that. I mean, it was associated with white people too, but also with pumpkin farmers in, in the South with, with African-Americans. Uh, and so it had a very different kind of connotation. Thanksgiving holiday after the war, it started slowly moving. And I even started seeing like where pumpkin, like looking at cookbooks and how it was starting to move um, South, but still it was a really strong, much stronger stories about it's sweet potato pie. And there was a quotation, a funny one. This was 1865, where in the Richmond, you know, Virginia dispatch, where it was editorializing about this kind of the spread of the national holiday of Thanksgiving and pumpkin into the South. The guy wrote that the day of Thanksgiving, when he, the Yankee, gorges to repletion with turkeys and pumpkin pie and honors the landing of the pilgrims who came to America to be at perfect liberty to deprive everybody else of their liberties is one of the great festivals of the day. So you can see there's kind of this snarky attitude towards the pumpkin and Thanksgiving in the South. So very conscious that it's not quite hasn't come together as a nation. And yet, um, but for W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, the famous African-American intellectual, he writes about African-Americans celebrating Thanksgiving in the holiday. But again, turning to these Southern cuisines and these Southern traditions. So not only was it the pumpkin had bad connotations there for the small scale farmers, but also they had these really rich traditions of making pies with sweet potatoes, that's an African crop. You know, a lot of African women were the ones that were had to cook in the kitchen when they were be, when they were enslaved, and then when they came out um, after slavery, then they were still these are traditions that continued on. So, um, you know, in some places the symbolism didn't work, and this is one still where it's you know it's just different stories. It's not just you can't get pumpkins in the South, but they were telling different stories about the pumpkins and then about sweet potatoes in this in the South. So it didn't resonate the same way. And also, you know, we can't imagine now because there's this veneration of um, the pilgrims at Thanksgiving, like what, you know, what's not to like about the pilgrims, I guess you could say. Um, but in the night, like with Whittier and in that time period, it was a long time. It was really like the late 19th century when Thanksgiving was associated with the pilgrims. So that was a time period, too, where, you know, when there's a lot of immigrants coming from Eastern Europe and other places and Anglo-Saxons are trying to figure out who they were. So they 
as I say, the origins of this country is with these Anglo-Saxons in the north, and that's when those they finally become part of the tradition. But before that, they weren't. Um, it was really just about these rural kind of values at the time. And so Thanksgiving, the pilgrims come late to the whole uh, the whole tradition. And this is what we all, I think, can understand about what's so interesting and fun about food, why we study it and not just like maybe want to cook recipes, is how these ideas and the taste come together. And so here's a great illustration of that 1890 goods pie. And you can see this image, how everything is working together. So you have like the natural plant, this idea of natural goodness that people are celebrating now, and maybe they ways they didn't in the past, but that they're celebrating nature and the value of nature. Um, and then you have this, the classic line from Whittier's poem, what moistens the lips and brings, uh, you know, what calls back the past. So this, this rural nostalgia, um, and then it's a pie recipe, and then you have the pie. So it's like you idea that you sweeten, you know, you create this dessert and you sweeten the ideas. Um, and then the other way around, these ideas that are so deep embedded in the pumpkin, you know, make the dessert taste good. Because as you know, I mean, does anybody know outside uh, uh, someone who's there's a guy from Scotland here? Almost nobody outside America likes pumpkin pie. I mean, they want to try it because they've heard of it, but most people don't like it. So it's very particular American thing. And if it's not like, I don't know, you know, apple pie, I suppose it's maybe something that would be a, it's a more accommodating taste to most people around the world, but this is particular. And so it's not natural that you would turn pumpkin into a pie and, and serve it um, like this. And so it's, you know, because of these stories and then how sweeten it can sweeten the stories as well. Uh, so now bumping ahead to the future. So it, I think if you want like, the, one of the most powerful expressions of American feelings and ideas about pumpkin and pumpkin pie is this, this is the issue of Time Magazine for Thanksgiving right after the 9-11 attacks. So here, you know, arguably one of the traumatic, most traumatic, you know, moments in American history. Um, so what the, you know, the magazine, this, this mainstream kind of news magazines decides to put on it is this very simple cover blank background with an American pie with a flag stuck in it with, with not even having to say much. So it's basically saying like, this is who we are. Like in a time of crisis, I mean, I don't know, you can imagine what they might've put on here, but it, this is what they turn to. They turn to the Thanksgiving pie to say, you know, our, our whole identity is threatened. And so we're trying to, you know, we're trying to bring a sense of peace and well being to the nation uh, you know, to our readers and they turn to the pumpkin pie. So instead of being something that's seen as like a food of last resort, you know, now it becomes like a symbol of patriotism, a symbol of like core American values. And it's also those ideas about how Americans like to think about themselves that, you know, always contrasting with Europe, especially in the 19th century, even the 20th that, you know, they're, uh, you know, American food is like plain food. It's, you know, it's, it's down home food. It's not pretentious food. So even trying to tell, I mean, we, you know, it can be a point of discussion about the imagine the kind of stories that you using this pumpkin pie to say about how they think about themselves. You know, even that idea, like we're farmers at heart, we're down, you know, we're honest, good, hardworking people. Of course, these are stories Americans tell about themselves. This doesn't mean that they're true. Um, you know, they're myths making. Um, but it's it's uh, the pumpkin pie has been a vehicle for, you know, a really important vehicle for them to tell those kinds of stories. So it's, you know, it's not just nutritional, these things, it's cultural enrichment, um, not just nutritional enrichment. This and, uh, you know, powerful symbolism of it. Um, and so, you know, then it starts. So that's the most extreme, powerful example. But of course, as we all know, we're inundated in every kind of, you know, way, any time of name the food. It's got pumpkin spice attached to it now. Um, and that's because the meanings become more important than the meat. Of course, you don't even need the meat anymore. Some people want to say like it's more authentic. Um, you know, if you put a little bit of the real pumpkin inside, whatever it is, name it, you know, your ravel or your beer, whatever. But, you know, as you can see by this cookie, as we know, you can just have the image of the pumpkin and that's all you need because it, that's the meanings become much more important than the meat itself. Uh, um, and then, of course, we're changing the nature of the pumpkin to make it a beautiful uh, symmetrical decoration, 
um, to fit these, you know, new ideas that we're or new uses we have with the pumpkin instead of just, you know, feeding it to the hogs, but putting our front store sto stoops as a symbol, a display of these kinds of values. And, you know, in a sense of community too, because we know people that we were part of a community when do we display these things? Um, so then too, so here's a good way to think about it as well. So I told you like pumpkins and squash are basically interchangeable. This is a squash variety. So this is a Libby select pumpkin it was used to be called the Dickerson pumpkin, but now they call it the Libby select. So it looks like a pumpkin, but it looks like a squash, right? And it's is like, there's, a, it's not a Cucupito pepo, which is what the, the field pumpkin is. It's a Masha, I think it is. So it can't actually breed with the with the with the field pumpkin, you know, it can't crossbreed. They're a little bit different, but it looks like a squash. But of course, they don't call it like Libby squash, right? They don't call it Libby <laughs> because nobody wants to eat scan. I mean, it doesn't even sound good to say, like, I don't even want to eat canned squash because the pumpkin means more. It's the same, you know, botanically, relatively. I'll show you another example too, but the pumpkin means more. So of course, they're not going to call the squash. They're going to call it pumpkin, and those terms have been used interchangeably for, you know, eons, but they call it pumpkin because the pumpkin means more. And the pumpkin has all these deep associations. And so, you know, and that's where they're, they're selling their crop. You can see, you know, it's as good and natural that not just one cute rosy cheek baby, but two, you know, rosy cheek babies. Um, and, oh, I wanted to wait <laughs> because I wanted to see if anybody could guess. So now, so that's one example to show how, it's this kind of, it doesn't really make sense, you know, have the same crop, but one's a pumpkin and means a lot and you can sell it for, you know, for, you would never sell canned squash. The other is these giant pumpkin festivals. And I know you guys have, I'm sure you've seen stories on local news, or maybe there's local contests that you've been about growing these giant Atlantic giant pumpkins. It becomes from a seed called the Atlantic giant. So now they just had another world record. Do you, does, can anybody guess what the world record giant pumpkin is? Have any idea? Just take a wild guess. I don't. I don't know if you have to put it in the chat because you can't. Six hundred. Go up. Not even close. Not even close. Come on, guys. <laughs> it is two thousand seven hundred forty-nine pounds. Uh, yeah. When they when they first broke the record, this was twenty years ago. If a thousand pounds, they you know they. It, this someone equated it with breaking the four minutes mile and track. So now they're up to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get rid of my chat screen. Um, now they're up to 200. Yeah. Almost yeah. 20, almost 2,800 pounds. But the crazy thing is, so you can see that the multi, the muddled nature of this vegetable. Um, I mean, this is like the, the ultimate symbol of natural abundance and the value of the symbolism more than the meat. I mean, you can't even move the darn thing. You know, you, nobody's going to eat it. The, actually, it's not really good. Just like the field pumpkin, you can eat it, but it's not really great flesh compared to some of these other squashes. Um, and uh, but people are spending hours and fortunes to grow this thing. Now, if you have it, this is I haven't checked the recent rules, but I'm pretty sure it's it's the same. But when I was this at least 10 years ago, this was the case. So you you plant these seeds and you have no idea what you're going to get, really. You know, you have to make sure the thing is you can't it, it's a balance between like giving it more and more water and whatever else nutrition you want to give it and not giving it too much that the thing cracks and explodes, you know, and so it's getting to its ultimate weight without having destroying the thing. But so if it is 80% orange, it's considered a pumpkin and can compete. But if it's less than 80% orange, so if it's 30% orange, I mean, 30% gray, blue or something like that, then it's not considered a pumpkin and it can't compete. But it's the same. You don't even know when you grow the thing necessarily what percentage is going to cop. So it's a, just another example, again, of the importance of the, the means and the value of this pumpkin, which is not practical. I mean, it's just the same crop. It's because those stories that started in the 19th century with the field pumpkin started representing all these really powerful agrarian ideals and ideas about uh, nature that the other crops, you know, the other types of winter squash didn't. So this is kind of the most extreme example of the symbol of natural abundance and then kind of the peculiarities of uh, the, the about how you make a decision about what a pumpkin is and, the, and those ideas surrounding it. So 
again, then just to reiterate that, that, you know, why we need to care about this is that be, the, the popularity of the pumpkin and making eating pie, even pie, you know, which most of it comes from canned pumpkin, the most sort of industrial form of production is still helping sustain small scale producers. And they would have to do a couple of years ago, I was interviewed by TV when I was um, in my normal home outside Philadelphia. And I was interviewed by a local TV program. They wanted to go out to a pumpkin farm. So we went out to this pumpkin farm and the guy had like, literally he had like 200 acres, which is almost no nothing outside Philadelphia, but he was the third generation. And before the camera's rolling, I was like, so, you know, how important is pumpkin to your farm? He's like 75%, 75% of what he, if his annual income comes from the popularity of the pumpkin and people going out there um, and buying this. So, I mean, that's why you need to care is these very romantic ideas. I said that not everybody buys into that don't quite make logical sense, but investing in it in this physical crop and eating these foods is actually helping to rejuvenate the very thing that we use to celebrate these things, the very thing that it represents. Um, and so like the bigger, I guess, takeaway too, is that, food is more than something that we eat, you know, that most of the reason that people take in certain foods and don't take in others, you know, most everything is edible. How we make those decisions is like the stories because of the stories our parents have told us, our community, you know, various reasons that we draw on mostly not practical. So in these say and age too, you know, there's a lot of concern with people's diets and uh, health issues towards obesity trying to get people, you know, to eat less of one food more than another. Also in terms of globally, people are worried about uh, having enough food to feed the planet with the population supposed to be 10 billion by, you know, 2050 even. So if you're trying to get to people to really think about what food is, you, you can't ignore how people invest their ideas and meanings in foods. And again, in the Americas, because there's almost no practical reason for pumpkin, many foods have different meanings, but it's a really great way to tell these stories because so much of it is is based on these ideas that we imbue in the in, in no kind of practical purpose. So I'll uh, stop there and I appreciate you listening and, and looking at my images and I'm looking forward to uh, um, having a conversation. And again, I don't know if everybody's muted or I'm hoping that we can have some kind of exchange and can get rid of the mute for everybody. Cause I know there's some questions in here, but uh, a few, um, but yeah. So hopefully we can have a conversation now. Well, what works if, if you would like people to actually ask you questions in person is for them to raise their hand and then um, uh, we can unmute them. Okay. Um, and I can hardly can see anybody, them. but I could, I guess I can, what I can do is get rid of my, or stop sharing and then I can see people. Yeah. But maybe you can help me because I don't know if I'll be able to. Yeah, Zero. I think Al can Al can unmute them. Uh, if people want to ask questions in person, uh, if you want to put questions in the chat, that's fine too. And uh, we'll uh, while we're waiting for people to uh, come up with questions, um, I have a couple for you. Um, I'm wondering, um, if, at what point was what did pumpkins become associated with Halloween in this country? So there was a old tradition of associating the pumpkin, which I tried to show with wild nature that goes mm -hmm. way back for Europeans to the, you know, 16th century. Um, and then there's a Halloween tradition and they both came together in the 19th century. So there's a tradition of, of the pumpkin of being associated with wild nature. Even there's a, a whippoorwill, um, which was kind of like a um, the pumpkin was associated like a jack-o'-lantern or Jack B. Lantern was an African-American mythological kind of like that you know if like you go through a swamp and there's a light or even in the dark woods and there's a light that's kind of creepy um there's so there's older folk tales about the pumpkin and this kind of wild nature and even if you see images of pumpkins like early 19th century they're um uh there's no jack-o'-lantern on them so like washington irving's the um Ichabod Crane, you know, what's it? The Legend of Sleepy yeah, Hollow. You know, that's like really, a, we can think about the associated with the Halloween and a jack-o'-lantern because it's like he's scared by this creepy thing and, the, and it's thrown, someone throws a pumpkin at him. Well, that wasn't a jack, that wasn't a jack-o'-lantern. So that predates, that's the older tradition of pumpkin being associated with wild nature that had nothing to do with Halloween. Then what happens is the uh, Irish, you know, with the, sadly, the potato famine, many of them have to leave in 1846 and many Irish people, uh, you know, come to the States and they bring that Halloween tradition with them. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, prejudice against uh, Irish people at the time. 
Um, they're considered like rustic to, you know, rustic, like, uh, um, you know, lower class, I guess you could say, you know, there's a lot of prejudice against them. But then that kind of rustic nature and their holiday was something that a lot of middle class white women in particular started celebrating. Again, kind of the idea that you go hiking on a trail in the national forest, you don't want to live in wildness, but it's sort of this some kind of, you know, scintillating, exciting about being close to wilderness that way for a moment. So you have this Halloween tradition fitting into that, that it's a you know, like little spirits are in the night um, and that you can have these parlor games where you can, you know, bob for apples or see like look reverse in a mirror and you'll know who your suitor is going to be in the future. And so the pumpkin's head like shape, it's time at harvest time of year. And these older traditions have uh, been so associated with wild nature um, made it a natural, you know, it, it logical why they would associate it. And before that, as someone had written on here, there was people used um, turnips. Um, in Europe, they use turnips to carve, which are, you know, much more difficult to carve. And, um, you know, so the pumpkin with his head right shape it, and these older symbols, I mean, it's not just practical, it's these old ideas that made it a logical part of things, you know, about uh, uh, Halloween in the mid 19th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the big pumpkin boat races. I mean, that's... <laughs> It's just, I mean, there's, that's what I think there is just something that's playful about the pumpkin because like, even still like you, there's this veneration with this idea of like the pumpkin farm and going out. Cause you know, like when you go to these pumpkin farms, no one's really going out there to learn about 21st century agricultural farm policy or what it's like. They want to go out there and be immersed in these like values. And a lot of these farmers, they'll say that like, we're a place where everyone's welcome. Like we are a place to, that people can get back in touch with these ideals in American culture. Like that's how a lot of these farmers see themselves. Um, and then of course there's, there's something banal about the pumpkin too. So you turn it into a boat. I mean, it's a big thing. Like why not try to do it? But it's often, there's a tongue in cheek thing about it that speaks something about, there's how some be people just they're like something about the pumpkin, these kind of positive associations that make it that adds to not the fact that it's just this a vegetable that you're made into a boat, which is silly. But then there's also then these very positive connotations. You know, the pumpkin, I showed that one picture of the politicians. So it's crazy how as much as gender relationships have changed, but how the consistent this idea with the pumpkin and human beings. So associated with a man, it's still almost always, you can look at almost every year when there's like a presidential election, somebody would be called a pumpkin head or there'll be some a political cartoon of a politician that looks like a pumpkin head because it's the idea of this empty, pompous, like they've got a big voice, but they got nothing inside. Women, historically, it's been associated with their bodies and like, and like being kind of like primitive in terms of like guided by their sexuality, like reproduction. And then women that are like living on like not just on the edge of civilization. Um, and we're like, you know, even the pumpkin carriage for Cinderella, it was a container for her and um, as opposed to, you know, in finding her prince. And, but then with kids, you know, kids, it was in the 19th century of the pumpkin when changing ideas about kids, it's, it's when Rousseau came and kids are like no longer little adults. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be natural and irresponsible. And that's when you started having like calling kids pumpkin, like he's a little pumpkin. I'm sure most of you, <laughs> their dog or a little kid, a pumpkin. And so those kind of very, you know, a natural abundance, it's goodness and innate natural abundance. That's probably kind of the associations also with these big pumpkin boats. It's a silly big vegetable, but then there's these stories too that would make it even more appealing. Yeah, I was thinking the Peter Peter pumpkin eater. Um, Had a wife and put her. Yeah. I kept her in a pumpkin shell. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, there's the jack, uh, you know, the jack-o'-lantern is a trickster character. Um, you know, and the, the derivations of Halloween is you either put stuff out to placate these, the spirits that walk the earth, you know, they're out that night for the, that died the year before, or you put a bonfire to keep them away. And Jack was a, one of these trickster characters that trick, tricked the devil. There's several different types of varieties of stories about him. Um, uh, uh pumpkins still grown and eaten reservations so you know as you know there's many different uh variety in american indian communities so um you know some tribes in california had communities in california were hunters and gatherers and they weren't agriculturalists at all 
um, mostly hunters in Montana where I'm from, buffalo hunters and wild plant gatherers. So they didn't really plant pumpkins and squash. Other communities did a mix of both. So like in the Northeast or in the Southwest where they would grow pumpkin, beans and squash and um, and then maybe, uh, you know, during the summertime and then go hunting other times. So I think there's two things going on. So I think in some communities where they had really, really old, old tradition that they can, they'll want to revitalize some of these foods. But then of course, American Indians are part of mainstream culture too. So a lot of them celebrate and appreciate the pumpkin for these larger ideas about agrarian life. A lot of people have come, you know, Indians, at least a crow become farmers and, and um, ranchers. And then they'll also celebrate them for a renewed appreciation of native cultures, even if they didn't grow them. So it's, you know, it's a variety of things. Um, yeah, so pumpkin, so Peppo, so the thing is when they, you know, when Europeans first came across the pumpkin, they, they were trying to define it and think about it and use it in ways of what they knew was familiar to them. I mean, all kinds of things happen. So like someone would describe a, you know, an elephant or something they never seen. So they, so they turn it into like something that was like the most elephant like in their culture and the like botanical like in these uh natural history tomes they would draw that without ever having really seen it so you know from the they are getting these documents back maybe before seeing the plant you know letters back or something or even the before they had the seeds and they would describe it like a melon um and so they would use use words like that like a mellow pup pepo or something pepo means you know to ripen it's a greek or um word and then um and then it was pompion was the French word for the pumpkin, but still it could be applied to all kinds of squashes or pumpkins. Um, and then uh, the, the pumpkin is an English derivation. And then that comes out of the bumpkin is this idea, like I was saying, like pumpkin rollers, which they can even actually use on the reservation for like Paul, small scale kind of scrappy, for, you know, it's like a lot of farmers in the 1920s, like they were these families with like eight kids, they're rattlesnakes, there's like frozen overalls on the line and they're out there trying to make a go of it. Those are like, pumpkins, you know, or maybe seen as unsophisticated. And the pumpkin then, you know, represents that the much for the reasons I've said, it's really a crop associated with very small rustic farm, and you can't really make a living off it. It's just basic sustenance. And so then that's the the dumpkin, you know, pumpkin dumpkin is a derivation of that. Um, someone asked for a good book on the history of pumpkins. Of course, you know, there's mine, the, the, uh, you can look it up, Pumpkin, the Curious History of an American Icon. And actually, I have a website too. Um, well, I have two, but one that's focused on the pumpkin. And I have a little uh, section about an exhibition. You can click on online exhibition, and then you can walk through some of the images, like the basic takeaways that I gave in this little history. And some of the images are there and how the pumpkin has changed over time. And um, so you can refer to that too, or you can you know get my books wherever books are sold. It's, it's funny, though, as I was saying before we came on, is there's just still every year a lot of press calling me about the pumpkin. And, you know, part of it is like, what the heck is going on with the pumpkin? I was just saying I was an economist this year of all things. But then it was like, why do people hate the pumpkin? Because there was this kind of a backlash with pumpkin spice latte. And then like French people are emailing me and they're like, so could you explain like what this is with Americans and the pumpkin? Because we eat pumpkin, but we don't go so crazy for it. So, Yeah. It's the big thing that, you know, right in plain sight that people are trying to understand. And, you know, most people I ask, of course, I've asked, I don't know, maybe thousands of people why they like the pumpkin and they don't know. They'll just say like, oh, my mom used to take me here, my parents, and I just like the feelings of the fall. So most people didn't quite know how to answer it. So that was kind of the point of my book to try to understand uh, why pe Americans in particular um, I really have this, this appreciation or, um, value, you know, the pumpkin. And then of course, why we need to care. And it's kind of a good story. It's, it's helping to rejuvenate these small, small, small scale farmers. Yeah, the color's great. And of course, you know, it's accentuate. And this is the thing, just like in those that 19th century painting where they're accentuating that color and then breeders are accentuating the colors. And so, you know, that becomes all the part of the association. It's not necessarily natural that orange is going to evoke all these, you know, meanings and stories, but the, the field pumpkin was the more orange or one. That was the one that represented these ideas so much because it was the least economically valuable, the biggest one. And so it's like, you know, it's like the chicken and the egg, you know, which came first, it's the color, we associate with all these beautiful, you know, beautiful and nice um, 
but the, you know, it could be that the stories came first and it just happened to be the orange pumpkin. And now they breed it to look like particularly beautiful, not all banged up. You know, like the Libby's pumpkin is not beautiful to look at, but it doesn't have to be because it's going right into the can. Yeah, that's right. Pumpkin spice versus Vegemite. And that's the story too, where, you know, a lot of it's just the spices and not, you know, they're related to pie. And of course the pie relates to all these, these, uh, these ideas about the pumpkin um, that where we start to sweeten the ideas that of the meanings that it has. Um, yeah, I mean, well, pumpkin is always, someone wrote about how pumpkin and using pumpkin in a vegan brownies is a filler. So that's the thing when there was like in the colonial period, when there was no barley for beer, there was no wheat for bread. Uh, they relied on the pumpkin. I mean, that's so pumpkin ale is popular now, but it was like, that's because you didn't have something. No one wanted to have pumpkin ale really, you know, but it's because if they didn't have something else, they could rely on the pumpkin, making vinegar out of it. They tried to make like a oil from the, you know, the oil is really great. If you guys have pumpkin seed oil, they still, you know, they produce it a lot in Austria and it's wonderful, but they tried to make an oil that would be like an industrial use of it. Um, so it's always been something that people have just, it's, it's prolific. It grows like a weed, it stores. So people have looked for all kinds of alternatives. And now it's considered, you know, healthy or like you give it to dogs because it's considered healthy. But, you know, I always I've argued, too, it's well, OK, it's sure it's low in calorie. It's got some vitamin D, but it's these deep meanings that people invest in it that I think people like to think about why it's healthy. You know, all these positive associations of natural abundance and rustic life and and nature that makes it kind of a health food, not just because it's, you know, low in calories or whatever. Um. Well, I mean, that's, it's not, so that's what I mean. So Ariana asked, isn't canned pumpkin actually butternut squash? So it's probably but butternut squash, but I showed you, I can um, go back to it, that what Libby's use, which is, um, you know, what 90% of the people use to, uh, and it doesn't, you know, it's not a botanical, pumpkin and squash is not a botanical term. It's a cultural term. So you can call anything, whatever you want. And so uh, this is a, probably you would call it a squash, but it does not like they're they're being nefarious by calling it, you know, canned pumpkin, because as we've said, the pumpkin means more. The squash doesn't mean as much. So why would you call it canned squash? I mean, nobody would buy it. So they call it pumpkin. Um, but this is technically, you know, it's not a cucupita beppo. It's not it couldn't cross with a um, with a with a uh, field pumpkin. But, you know, historically, there was there's nobody worried about these differences. The differences came about when people started thinking about using the pumpkin to think about this kind of world and starting to see it as like an important part of American heritage or personal heritage even. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's you can call it it's a pumpkin. They don't use butternut squash for sure. They use this is like the Dickinson, but it looks like a squash on the inside. But, yeah. And, you know, so it's thicker meat. It's a little drier. You know, so Libby's is, uh, I can't speak for the other brands, but Libby's is 100% pumpkin. But what they do is they, which you know, if you've tried to cook with fresh pumpkin, is they take a little of the liquid out. So it's much more condensed than if you use fresh. So like if you use, you know, you used to use in a pie recipe, like a lot of the pie recipes are geared towards a canned pumpkin now, which is much denser flesh, flesh than if you use just a uh, regular pumpkin. It's just got a little more moisture. So you have to change your recipe. So it's a, I would say it's a pumpkin. They're not, yeah, but you know, it's, it's a cultural story to explain why they would call it pumpkin instead of squash. Um, yeah, pumpkins are fruit. So like a tomato or something where they have the seed pocket in the center. So technically they're a fruit. So you can call it a fruit, but we don't think of it, you know, as a fruit really like a tomato is a fruit, but we don't vernacularly. So that's where like science and natural science can kind of divert in terms like popular uses of things versus scientifically how, you know, it might be categorized. It's another one of these crazy. All right. Well, I guess if that's it, thanks so much for being here. And um, 
I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving and maybe have some stories to add at the table this year. Um, if someone asks or even if they don't ask, <laughs> you can volunteer that you've learned about the pumpkin today. Thank you, Cindy. We really appreciate it. Uh, this has been a wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, it's pumpkin pie time. And uh, I, I'm very, very happy that we were able to schedule you uh, for such a timely occasion. And I yeah. uh, just want to remind um, folks who are still with us um, that we won't have a regular meeting on December uh, in December, but we will. <clears throat> excuse me. We will have our uh, our uh, traditional theme meal, and uh, there's more information about it on our website. So uh, check out the website, uh, Culinary Historians Ann Arbor .org, and we'll hope to see you all next uh, in, next year. Actually, in January, um, our first speaker will be talking about the uh, foods of the uh, salt. Uh, excuse me, the foods of Oman. And uh, that will be an in-person presentation, but it will also be available online if you're um, going to be uh, wanting to join us from someplace outside of Ann Arbor. So uh, with that, we again will say thanks to Cindy and I hope everyone has a wonderful, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of- Happy rest Thanksgiving, of thanks for being here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.